Now it's time to get into the nuts and bolts of SSAT physics to get your 800. So maybe you want to take some notes or maybe you just want to sit back and watch the video. Some students want to watch the video a couple of times, then take notes. How you do it is up to you, but I promise you that the videos that you're going to see contain all the information that you need to get your 800. Because remember, you can get 82% of the questions correct and still get an 800. So 800 is where we're shooting for. That's my website, getfreducated.com. You already know that the, um, that the um, password is fredukator, the educator. And the website contains lecture notes for you, examples, derivations. These are things for which you're not responsible on the test. How did the equations come about? You just need to memorize them. But if you're interested in from where they originated, you can watch and look at the derivations. And quizzy poos that we'll also do not only on the website, but in person. My 800 number, if you need to call me, 800-666-MATH. Oh, that was fun. Uh, motion in one dimension. So the key here, and if you take away one thing, it's this. All of the equations that have to do with motion that we deal with on the SSAT physics test are acceleration A is constant. The acceleration does not change within the problem. That's left for AP Physics 2 and advanced uh, physics courses in college. So I want to make a distinction between distance and displacement, speed, and velocity. These things here are have no direction. They're just numbers. Velocity and displacement are vectors. They have numbers and direction. And so I can easily show you that here if we start with this big red sphere ball and it moves to here, moves back and moves to the finish, the distance that we traveled was eight plus five plus five plus five plus seven. So that's 15 and 15 more for 30. So in two seconds, we covered in distance 30 meters. So therefore, the average speed is 30 meters in two seconds or 15 meters a second. But that's not the velocity because the velocity cares about the displacement. You start here, you finish here. The total distance that you went, the displacement is just from here to here or 15 and five more for 20. So your velocity was displacement over time, 15 over two or 7.5 meters per second. And the slope of velocity versus time is acceleration. So if you look at a velocity curve, the slope of the velocity, the change in velocity with time is acceleration and the change in distance with time or the change in displacement with time is velocity. So the slope of a velocity curve is going to be, um, the slope of a velocity curve is going to be your acceleration, but the slope of a uh, distance curve is going to be your velocity. Change in distance over change in time is velocity. Think about the units, miles per hour. And we can also talk about what the areas underneath certain curves mean. So the velocity is the uh, total velocity is the area versus time under the curve. And the displacement is a velocity curve and the area underneath it. We'll learn more about that. It'll be easier for you to see that when we do some examples. A little vector review, please. 
Here is the y-axis and x-axis, and the right angle of a triangle always appears on the x-axis. Don't draw the triangle so that this is the right angle. This is the triangle of interest. And a vector has two components, the x in light blue and the y in light blue. And the Pythagorean theorem will tell us what the vector b is. It, this is a right triangle, so this squared plus this squared is this squared. The magnitude is the length of B, and the angle is the angle between the x-axis and the vector. Remember Sokotoa, the Indian chief? Uh, he, the Indian chief got up in the middle of the night, stubbed his toe, it hurt. He had to sew Katoa to feel better. Uh, although I do have students that, re that remember it with horses, Saunter our horses, canter away happily toward other adventures. So use the mnemonic that works for you, but the sign of an angle is the opposite side, the side opposite the angle divided by the hypotenuse. The cosine is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse, and the tangent is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. And so your right triangle is the hypotenuse, theta is between the hypotenuse and the adjacent side, and the opposite side is away from theta. You might say to me, well, wait a minute, isn't this adjacent to theta? Yes, it is, but it is also a special side, it's the hypotenuse. So we call this one the adjacent side, and while the hypotenuse is adjacent to theta, it has a special name, the hypotenuse. And the Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus o squared is h squared. So if we want to know what this vector is in length, it's b times the cosine of theta, and y is b times the sine of theta. So remember, they're alphabetical. C comes before S in the alphabet, X comes before Y in the alphabet. So the X vector uses cosine and the Y vector uses sine. The mnemonic is it's alphabetical. We'll use those when we break up a vector. Maybe you remember this, maybe not, it's okay. It's better to memorize the result because you don't have time to derive this on the test. You need to get through the problems in a minute. So the sine of 2 theta, the sine of 2 times the angle, if theta was 50 degrees, the sine of 100 degrees is 2 times the sine of 50 times the cosine of 50. You do not need the derivation on the SSAT set test. So you don't need to know where this came from. It's quite a long derivation, but you don't need it. So here's an example. It's a, a triangle that's right with the angle theta here, and the uh, sides are three and four. What is the hypotenuse? Maybe you remember the famous three, four, five triangle, but three squared is nine, four squared is 16. Add nine and 16 together and get 25. That's what this squared is. The square root of 25 is five. So the sine of this angle theta, and we don't know what it is, is 3 over 5, or 0.6. And the cosine of the angle is 4 over 5, or 0.8. And of course, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. 0.6 squared is 0 0.36. 0 0.8 squared is 0.64. If you add 0.64 to 0.36, you'll get 1. It is always true that the sine squared plus the cosine squared is 1. So if I know the sine, but I don't know the cosine, I can find it with the Pythagorean theorem. So we don't even have theta, but or even two theta, but we know that theta, I'm just telling you, by the way, it's 36.87 degrees. I used a calculator. You're not allowed to use one. You don't have to know what it is to know the sine and cosine of an angle. And that's what's going to help you in the problems, is knowing the sine and cosine. Adding and subtracting vectors. This happens with uh, visually very easily. If these are vectors A and B, they form the two sides of a 
uh, parallelogram. So if you complete the parallelogram, the big diagonal is A plus B. And if you want to know what the small diagonal is, it's A minus B. So point to uh, start at B, the one you're subtracting, and move to the one from which you're subtracting it. That's B minus, that's A minus B. See, here's B. Behind it, 180 degrees is negative B. And if you add A, you can pick up a vector and move it as long as you don't change its length and you don't change its direction. They both point this way, they're parallel. And so A is over here as well as here. Here's B, so here's negative B, 180 degrees behind it. When I add A and negative B, I get this vector here, which is this one here. So that's how you do it visually, but I find it easier to remember that A plus B is the long diagonal and A minus B is the short diagonal pointing toward the positive one, A. A minus B points to A from B. We add vectors tip to tail, so you could pick up B, move it up to A, and there's A plus B forms the main diagonal of the parallelogram. So adding vectors is fine. Again, delta confuses some students. It means change in, and it is always the final value minus the initial value. So if x starts at 4 and winds up being 12, 12 minus 4 is the change, or 8. If it starts out as 10 and it becomes 3, 3 minus 10, or negative 7, is delta x, or the change in x. Remember, here's a, a circular track I drew with a little light blue car on it, and the direction that the car travels is counterclockwise. Suppose it starts here and finishes here. What was its average velocity? Well, remember, velocity is related to the displacement. If the car started here and finished in the same place, its displacement was zero. So the average velocity is zero. But speed is a scalar. So what was the average speed? Well, speed distance equals rate times time. So the rate is going to be distance over time. And the distance it traveled is 2 pi r over the time it took. So if we calculate... We know the radius of this particular um, track is 318.3 uh, meters. So the circumference is 2 pi r, or 2,000 meters, and we did it in 50 seconds. So the distance, 2,000 over 50, is 40 meters per second. So there is a difference between the average speed and the average velocity. Why? Because speed and velocity are different types of mathematical animals. Speed is a scalar. It only has a value. And velocity depends upon a vector, the displacement. And if I start and finish here, my displacement is zero. But the distance I traveled is not zero. Just like asking what would happen if I was over here. Well, then my displacement would be from here to here, or 2r, but the distance I traveled would be half of 2 pi r. So you must keep straight in your head, am I dealing with a vector, or am I dealing with a scalar? Am I dealing with a scalar speed, or a vector velocity? And when we do problems, we'll make a big deal about it. If I have a graph of displacement or velocity versus time or acceleration versus time, they look like this. Here, what I've done is say, here's no acceleration. Acceleration is zero. And the, uh, that means that the velocity is constant. It doesn't have to be zero, but if we're not accelerating, 
the velocity will remain constant. And over here, I have an acceleration. So the acceleration there, and again, I, the velocity could be constant at zero or, another, or constant here. Remember, the slope of distance with time is velocity. So this slope is the velocity. Here, the slope was zero. The uh, distance with time was zero. It's sitting, the object is sitting still. Its velocity is zero. Its acceleration is zero. Here, we are changing the distance along a line, so we have a velocity. But the slope of the velocity curve is zero, so we are not changing our acceleration. It remains constant. Here, I'm showing you that the distance is decreasing parabolically. The slope is changing, so the velocity is changing. And then I have to decide what that means about acceleration. We'll do more examples of that as we get to the main point, which is here. These are the most important equations that you will face in the first part of your SSAT physics. They, they answer about 20% of the questions. They're called the big four. Some books call them the big five or big six because they add some of those uh, equations in, like uh, the fact that uh, the change in velocity or the change in distance with time is velocity. They include that. To me, that's obvious. It's a definition. What is the velocity? Change in displacement with time. But these equations here, remember distance equals rate times time in seventh grade where we did uh, made a box and we did distance, rate, and time. This is now because the velocity is not constant. Distance equals average rate, add them together, divide by two, times time. And the velocity final is equal to the initial velocity plus at. That's just a line. The final velocity is the initial velocity times the slope times time. These two equations can be manipulated with algebra, for which you are not responsible to get these two equations. That's why I wrote them in different colors. These are the two main equations, and these are the four equations that you should memorize. I write I for the initial velocity. Sometimes I will write it as V sub zero. It's the velocity at time equals zero. You can use an I for initial or a zero for time equals zero. But we have displacement. You might use D or X or Y or H. Velocity initial or velocity sub zero. VF is final and acceleration. Almost everybody uses A. And so there are five unknowns of interest to us. The, the acceleration, the initial velocity, the final velocity, the distance, and time, t. And every one of these equations contains how many variables? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And yet there are five unknowns. So if I know three of the unknowns, I can find one of these equations that has those three unknowns in it. Suppose I know the distance, the initial velocity, and the time. I could manipulate this equation with a little bit of algebra to find Vf. So if you know three of the unknowns, you can find all five of them. And being able to do that answers about 15 or 20 percent of the questions that you will be asked on the kinetics or movement part of uh, the SSAT. So do yourself a favor. You do not want to derive these equations. Memorize them. Write them down. Write them down every night. Take a piece of paper out and write down the four equations because in order to get through all of the mechanics in SSAT, you probably need fewer than 40 equations. And they're not all as complex as this one here or this one here. So if you remember 40 equations, because they're not going to give you an equation sheet and you can't have a calculator. So you've got to memorize these, and that will be your key toward writing the equation down and solving it. 
it'll be relatively easy to do. Here's an example. A toy car starts at two meters per second and accelerates at half a meter per second squared for five meters. How long does it take? I'm looking for time, but I know the initial velocity, I know the acceleration, and I know the distance. So I am lacking time. So I wrote the four equations down, which is something you might try, and I circled the things that I knew. I know distance and initial velocity. I don't know the final velocity or time, so I'm a little out of luck on this equation because they're two unknowns. Again, two unknowns. Here again, ah, there's my equation. And here's my equation. They're both good to use because they each contain an uh, one unknown. This one, to get time, how long does it take, you must solve a quadratic equation, which you're welcome to do, but it's harder than first finding the velocity by plugging in the initial velocity, 2 squared, and adding 2 times a half, which is 1 times 5, so here we have 5 and 4 square root to get the velocity, which is 3. And then we can use that in this equation here, um, to get, or uh, this equation here, to get the time. Or this equation here to get the time. So solve a quadratic equation if you like, if you're fast at it. But find the variable they're not asking for with an easier equation. And then use another easy equation to find the variable they're asking for. The time becomes two seconds. And we can check that in this equation here if we want to. The final velocity I said was three equals the initial velocity plus A times the time, which we found to be two seconds. So three equals two plus a half times two is one. So two, three equals two plus one, which is certainly correct. So we can check our work by plugging the unknowns into our equations and seeing if they work. Memorize these four equations. You will be really happy that you did because they are the key to success. I think it would be wise for us to do some examples of that now and then continue this lecture I was going to, to get into the review of concepts and talk about some graphs, which I will uh, in a minute, but I want you to practice those big four equations and be comfortable with them. So let's take a brief pause now and come back and solve uh, a bunch of examples using the big four so that you become more comfortable using them. Okay, thanks.